All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hopping on for this week's uh, Making Multifamily Call. Oops. I'm not unmuted. Hi, everyone. Thank you for hopping on for this week's uh, Making Multifamily Call. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. All good. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Cool. All right. So I see, um, I think, quite a bit of uh, new faces here. Um, so I'll just start from the, the beginning. Um, so myself um, started off and grew up in the Bay Area, came from a middle class family. Uh, to be honest, my, my parents didn't really like real estate. They, they saw it as very risky. So I didn't really have any education uh, from anybody in my family. So I'm pretty much uh, self-educated, probably spent around uh, 10,000 hours uh, educating myself about real estate uh, between single family, multifamily, uh, mobile home parks. <laughs> and um, probably spent around $30,000 between mentors, uh, courses. Um, <clears throat> so definitely invested a lot of money into education. Um, in terms of my career trajectory, I went the traditional W-2 route. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm a pharmacist by trade. I'm actually a pharmacy director at a hospital um, based here in LA uh, currently. And quickly what I learned is in, in healthcare, um, you get flatlined real quick. So, you know, you make a good income, but like it kind of stays um, stagnant. Like my income hasn't really changed in the past seven years, but you know, gas is now like what, $7 in California in some places. And actually during COVID, um, I actually got laid off and that was during the peak of COVID. So it's kind of ironic that they're, they're laying off hospital workers, uh, during a COVID pandemic. So very, very eye opening for me. So in an ironic way, when I got laid off, I, that's when I started um, really learning more about real estate and diving in. So I, I started off in single family. So for me, I, I bought a house in the Bay Area, 10% uh, down. I house hacked the property. So what I did was I just rented, I lived in the master bedroom, rented out the other three bedrooms. So I got $3,000 a month from those three tenants and it just helped cover my expenses. Yeah, I just progressed that. So every year I basically house hacked a new house. So I would do down 10%, 10%. I repeat that. And then I quickly realized that it's not scalable. Like a single family home in California, it's like a million dollars. And if you go out of state, you can buy like a 34 unit apartment complex um, for a million dollars. And in California, you get like maybe four to $5,000 in rent for a single family home. But with an apartment complex, you know, like my 26 unit, I got, which I got for half a million dollars, I get $10,000 a month, like day one. And after I'm done with renovations, um, I'm probably gonna get closer to like maybe 15 to $17,000 a month. So like, th that's more like life changing money, right? Like, you know, four to 5,000 is great. That yeah, breaks even for the most part. But once you start getting to that $17,000 range, and let's just say you net like maybe five to 6,000 at that point, it's almost like replacing my W2 income. So that's when I kind of learned about, you know, the power of multifamily. So what really um, was eye opening for me was, so if you have like two single family homes, like right next to each other, one rents for 5,000 a month, the other one rents for $10,000 a month. When you go to sell that home, they're, they're valued the same because they're both valued based on sales comparables. So like rent doesn't even matter, but with multifamily, the value is based on the NOI divided by the market cap rate. So NOI is a fancy way of saying net operating income, which is a fancy way of saying income minus expenses before debt service. And then the market cap rate, that's just a fixed number. So California, it's like a three cap market or a two to three cap market versus in Oklahoma where I invest, it's a eight cap market. So what that means is if you have an eight cap market, you're more likely to cash flow um, versus a two cap market. But if you kind of look at the equation, it's NOI divided by market cap rate. So as you increase your income, so when you increase your rents or decrease your expenses, it increases your NOI, it increases the value of the apartment complex. So once I learned that equation, it, it blew my mind. Um, so in that, going back to that previous example, if you had an apartment complex that made $5,000 know, a year versus an apartment complex that made $10,000 a year, 
the one that makes ten thousand dollars a year is worth double the one that's five thousand. So you, it's forced depreciation essentially. So once I kind of learned that concept, I never looked back. I, I dived in, you know, hundred percent into multifamily, specific apartment complexes, and then later progressed uh, to mobile home parks. So, so yeah, that that's kind of how I started, but. I scaled pretty quickly, so you guys probably all saw my post. In about a year, I bought a 26 unit apartment complex. Um, three months later, I got a 100 lot mobile home park in Alabama. And then most recently, back in like May of this year, I got a 20 unit apartment complex. Um, all these I got with my own money. I don't, I don't have any partners. I didn't raise any money. I didn't syndicate this deal at all. I seller financed two of them. Um, and all three of these are off markets. So because of that, you know, I was able to scale rapidly um, without, you know, really much money of my own. So <clears throat> that's just kind of a quick kind of oversight of myself. And if you guys have any questions, just put it into the comments. And then I will, after I'm done kind of sharing my 26 unit, um, I'll go through the questions. So for my 26, um, so what I did or... When I first started in multifamily, the first thing I did was I went on LoopNet and I quickly found out that when you go on LoopNet, all those deals are terrible. Like they're literally the leftover scraps. And all it taught me was I was just practicing how to analyze deals on LoopNet and trying to learn about brokers and, you know, networking with um, brokers. But like when I quickly like analyzed the deals, you know, most of these deals were passed through like 50 to 100 investors. And like no one wanted these deals. There's a reason why it didn't sell. Because um, number one is overpriced. Number two, maybe the owner is not being transparent with their financials. And then after analyzing a bunch of deals, I quickly found out that a lot of these brokers, like no, no offense to brokers, but they're fabricating the numbers. As I mentioned earlier, the NOI or it's based the value is based on NOI divided by the market cap rate. So the, the brokers would artificially deflate the expenses, inflate the income, give you a, uh, an NOI based on performa, which is not the actual income. So you're basically paying for the upside. So for me, it was just very eye opening. And also, like when I called these brokers, so what I did was I would call the brokers in Oklahoma, my market. I would call them about once a week. So I had a list of like five to six brokers. That I would just call every week. I would send them letters. I would send them text messages. I was just trying to stay fresh on mind, but they never took me seriously because I was, I was a new buyer, right? I owned a couple single family homes. They don't care. Like the broker, they only care if you can close and they get the 3% commission. So they want to work with people who have experience. They want to work with people who have a track record. So they don't take you seriously. So, after doing that, I quickly realized that, man, like, how do I find these good deals? So I, I started researching about, you know, finding off-market deals. You know, people tell you, you can get off-market deals by brokers. And, you know, brokers bring me off-market deals now, but I'll, I'll be honest, most of the deals brought to me by brokers are terrible. Like, like last week, I underwrote a deal that was sent to me by a broker, and it was probably valued $1.5 million over the asking price. So like, this is what I mean by how terrible the deals are. Um, so what I did was I basically wanted to cut the broker out of the equation and I started a direct uh, mailing campaign. So for those of you who don't know, I use PropStream um, to get my data. And I use a company called Yellow Letters Complete uh, to outsource my lettering campaign too. Um, so I, I mailed out about 300 letters a month for six months. And that basically helped me close on my two apartment complexes. So, you know, it, it, I basically worked directly with the owner. So on my 26 unit, I mailed out my letter. I think I mailed out around 12, about 1800 letters over the span of six months. And the first like one to three months, I didn't get much of a response. Like typically you get a 3% response rate. So if I mailed out 300 letters, I get about, you know, 10 people who will call me. And out of those 10, um, maybe like one to like three might be actually serious in terms of wanting to sell. A lot of the other ones, they're, I call them fishers. They just basically, hey, you're a rich guy from California, like overpay for my apartment complex. 
But for me, like, I just want to pay what it's worth, right? Like what it's worth to me. You know, I'm from California. Yes, single family homes, like $2 million, but I don't want to overpay for a property in a different market. So um, that's how I kind of started. And a, so this, I mailed up my letter and they can usually reach out to me by calling me. They can text me or send me an email. So this owner, he's actually an attorney uh, based in Oklahoma City, and he emailed me. And a weird thing was that, like, he would only communicate to me via email, I think because he's a lawyer. Like, he wanted everything documented. He wanted everything, um, you know, written and, you know. So because of that, I just communicated him literally over um, email. And so typically, like, you know, when you talk to someone over the phone, you can build a little more trust. You can build a little bit more um you know rapport of them essentially i'm a stranger i mailed a letter right I'm, I'm just a nobody from california um i'm just a pharmacist from california like who am i right like i'm just some random person sending you a letter so it's nice to talk to them to build that trust and rapport and that's what i typically try to do in the first call like I'll, I'll typically ask like hey like um how long have you owned this property and that's an easy icebreaker and because people that do real estate they love talking about real estate so um it's an easy icebreaker but in this case, like it was all email. So I just literally said, Hey, like, tell me about your property. He basically told me that he owned it for 20 years. So, you know, if it's 20 years, what does that kind of key you in? So it kind of hinted to me that the property's paid off because most apartment complexes are amortized over 20 to 30 years. So the property actually was paid off um, for that. So um, that's how I kind of, you know, basically got the deal. And then he gave me some financial information. You know, I asked for the tax return, but it's pretty sensitive information, right? A lot of people don't want to offer their tax return. So he kind of took the information from his tax return, put it on a profit and loss statement. And then he um, basically sent me the past three years of P&Ls. You know, I was averaging $10,000 a month. I think the income was roughly around maybe four to $5,000 a month. So kind of out the gate, I kind of quickly caught on that, you know, the expenses should be around 50%. <clears throat> so he wasn't lying to me. He wasn't fabricating the numbers. Like a lot of brokers, a lot of syndicators, I hate it whenever they, you know, they undersell the expenses to boost up the NOI. But, you know, both my apartment complexes, it's 50% expense. And because my apartment, my 26 unit was all bills paid. So all bills paid essentially means that the landlord covers all the utilities. So I cover uh, the water, the trash, gas, electric, for everything with the current tenants. Um, so because of that, the expense is closer to 60%. And that's what I'm currently operating at. So a lot of like brokers say that it's like, oh, it's 30 to 40% expense. That's complete. That's a complete lie. That, that is a complete lie. And if a syndicator ever tells you that it's a 30% <laughs> expense ratio, they're definitely lying to you. Or they're just so inexperienced that they don't know like what the expense should be. So just be cognizant about that um, when brokers approach you as well as syndicators approach you. So uh, to continue, you know, basically I asked for a rent roll. Um, so basically a rent roll, you want to know what units are occupied, what the current rent is, and if they're month-to-month -month tenants or not. So what's nice about month-to-month -month tenants is that, like, when you take over the property, you know that, like, you can raise the rents immediately if they're way under market rents. So my, most of my tenants were like the, the owner, he hasn't raised rents in the past like five years. He was a full-time working attorney and he literally did his own pest control. He did his own property management and he used one of the units as the office. So, you know, I basically got the information and I sent it over to my mortgage broker. So what's nice about a mortgage broker is that they shop your deal amongst many different lenders. Um, and you pay them like a one to three percent um, of the loan fee, so I, I ended up paying him like a couple thousand dollars. But he was able to connect me with uh, Bank of the West, um, so that's who I used to close on this twenty six unit. So I basically had to do twenty five percent down. I had four point three percent interest, thirty year amortized, uh, ten years fixed, with a one percent prepayment penalty. So with um, from my experience of lending, um, national lenders like Bank of the West, they'll typically give you 30-year amortized. If you use a community local bank, they will typically give you about 25%. Um, so that's kind of you know where you kind of start. 
So what's interesting about this owner was that I, I, I typically ask like, hey, like what's a good price look like to you? You know, that's kind of negotiations one on one. Like you want the owner to anchor a price. Like I kind of know what price to offer, but you want the owner to anchor the price first. But ninety percent of the time, the owners will say, "Well, make me an offer," right? <laughs> so you know, some owners will say, "Make me an offer," without giving you any financial information at all. Like that happened to me like so many times too. So what I do is I just look up the tax assessed price. That's literally um, public information. So I, you just type in the address to figure out which county it's in. So my, my property is in Oklahoma City, so it's in Oklahoma County, which is pretty easy. But if you don't know what county it's in, just Google search the address and add the word county at the end, and they'll tell you it, it's count what county it's in. And then from there, you just type in like Oklahoma County Tax Assessor's Office. So once you Google that, you just click on the first link that populates, and then you click search property. Then you search your property address, and then you can pull up the tax record. And it'll tell you what the tax assessed price is. So I pulled up the tax record. It said that this 26 unit is worth 520K. So li literally, um, I just offered, I, I wrote them an LOI. So for those who don't know, an LOI stands for letter of intent. That, that's what you use in um, commercial real estate. It's a one pager, quick document. It's a non binding agreement. But all it basically does is it sets the purchase price, the earnest money deposit. The due diligence uh, window, um, as well as um, what the finance, you know, the um, the contingencies are. So it's a really quick one pager. What title um, company, insurance company you use? So you know, and then and then he actually accepted my offer immediately, and I was actually really surprised because I was expecting him to counter me and to go through this whole negotiation um, process. So once I got it uh, under LOI. Um, I just basically drafted the purchase and sale agreement. I mean, it's not that hard. Like that's all brokers usually do for you anyways. The realtors, they just kind of felt this generic standardized template and Oklahoma, they had a, if you literally Google Oklahoma state, um, commercial real estate purchase and sale agreement, it, it's like the first thing that populates. And then it's like a seven page document that you fill out. It's pretty self-explanatory. You just put the address, the buyer's name, the seller's name, the contingencies, you know, they have default templates in there. Um, so it literally took me like 30 minutes to do that. And that was the first contract I ever did. So, I mean, it's not like rocket science to do it. So I basically drafted that, sent the contract over, he signed it and then we're under escrow. So, you know, at that point I, um, basically started due diligence. So for due diligence, uh, what you want to do in an apartment complex and just so everyone knows, I'm actually recording everything. I'm, I'm intentionally going pretty fast. Um, because I want to do Q&A at the end and I see a lot of questions in the comments, but you know, I am going fast. You just can, I upload this on YouTube on Thursdays. So definitely um, you can just listen to it again and rewind. Um, but basically due diligence is 30 uh, calendar days from when you go under contract. Um, so, so basically uh, calendar days is like, it includes the weekend. If you do 30 business days, it's only Monday through Friday. So you get additional days if you do business days. So I, I typically recommend people do business days in their contract because it gets you more time. But, you know, I did uh, 30 calendar days because the owner wanted me to close a little faster. So what I did was I hired an inspector and you want to inspect every single unit. If you have a 26 unit apartment complex, you want to inspect every, all 26 units. If you have a 100 unit apartment complex, you want to inspect all 100 units. It, it costs a lot of money. Like for reference, it cost me $5,000 to inspect all 26 units. If you're in single family homes, it's like 500 bucks for like a house. It's like nothing. But in, in multifamily, it's going to be about um, uh, $5,000. So I see a question by Philip. Yes, for the first inspection, I was actually on site. Um, to be honest, I'm not very handy at all. I was just there just to kind of see the area to meet the property manager and to kind of just fill out the area, to be honest. Like, you know, now when I close on my deals, I don't even like on my 20 unit I just bought recently, I didn't even show up. Like I literally just had my uh, property manager just take photos. And then when you hire the inspector, they actually take like pictures of all the units, the exterior, interior, and every single unit. So they give you like the inspection reports, like a hundred pages. And they go through each unit, like unit number one to, through 26. And they'll actually talk about the exterior, the roof, plumbing, electrical, termites, HVAC, everything. It's like A through Z. And then during the inspection, you always want to make sure your inspector is there. Obviously, 
you want your property manager there. You want the other property manager there so they can open all the doors. And then from there, um, you also want to have a general contractor because you basically want to start bidding on everything because the inspector will start seeing deficiencies and you want a price associated with that because that's what you're going to use to negotiate for seller repair credit. So after the inspection, what I typically do is, so it, for reference, it took eight hours and three inspectors to inspect 26 units. So if you have a hundred unit apartment complex, it's going to take you four to five days and you're probably going to have three to four inspectors. That's how long it takes. Um, to do a full thorough inspection. But what I do at the end is I will debrief with the lead inspector. And my concern is, are there any huge red flags that I'm like worried about? And the, the huge red flags would be, is the roof good? You know, is there any plumbing issues? Is there electrical okay? Like those big ticket items. And if there is an issue with them, you want to get a price associated with that. So my 26 unit needed a new roof. So I got a, a, a contractor to bid and it cost me $35,000 to replace that roof. So once you kind of compile that information, I literally um, asked for $120,000 in seller repair credit. So keep in mind, this was $520,000 purchase price, 25% down. So my down payment was roughly like 180, 180K. So I was asking for 120K in seller repair credit, which would have reduced my down payment to $60,000. So basically I'd own a 26 unit apartment complex for $60,000, which is like what, like less than 10, like about 10% down. And that's like single family, right? That's like what you do in single family down 10%. So, um, you know, I, I basically sent the, the owner, the inspection report. I sent the owner all the quotes and the bids. I, I don't make up anything. I'm fully transparent. And I just said, Hey, I want $120,000 in seller repair credit. And why I do that is because it's kind of a scare tactic, unfortunately, like, cause if they don't, you know, if let's say they don't want to fix anything and it's as is, and he did tell me it was as is initially, then at that point, um, you know, if I back out, he knows that like, I have to fix $120,000 worth of expenses. And that kind of freaks him out a little bit. But then he just kind of said, you know, the property's as is, that's what's in the contract. But hey, if you lower it a little bit or make it more reasonable, like what needs immediate attention, then I'll consider giving you some cell repair credit. So what I did was I talked to my property manager and she said, well, what, what items would you want to focus on? And what we did was, you know, the roof, obviously, because if you want insurance, you need a new roof or a good roof because insurance really focuses on that. And then um, a lot of like um, electric panels were actually uh, recalled. So that's actual safety hazard, electrical safety hazard. So I got all those. And then there are a lot of potholes in the, in the, in the road on the driveway. So I got credits for that. So I ended up getting $60,000 back in seller repair credit. So that's why I mean like a lot of like real estate investors, it, it irritates me. They're, they're very, they pinch pennies, but they drop dollars. So like I spent $5,000 to inspect all 26 units. That's expensive, right? But because of that thorough inspection, I got $60,000 in seller repair credit. So I basically 10 X my return in seller repair credit. So, um, because there might be a situation where you inspect all, you know, 26 units and you might have to walk away and then you lost $5,000. But, you know, if you can't afford to lose $5,000, you have no business doing apartment complexes, in my opinion. So you kind of have to spend money to, um, you know, kind of make money in, in a sense. So I got $60,000. It reduced my down payment in half. And I think I downed around like 15% to own my first apartment complex. Um, so after... Um, you know, my, my bank appraised it and the property appraised at $750,000. So I literally made $250,000 equity day one, like doing nothing, like just by sending out letters. I made $250,000 equity day one. And actually a month ago, um, an investor offered me $1.3 million for my 26 unit. So that's a $800,000 profit. And I didn't even start renovations yet. So I, I could have made, flipped this and made $800,000 and try to trade up to in a bigger apartment complex, but I uh, haven't been able to um, land a bigger apartment complex yet, or I don't want to deal with the stress of doing a 1031 exchange because um, you have a six uh, month time window. So I, I'm buy and hold. So like for me, my plan is to start renovating all the units. I'm actually doing renovations right now. Um, so right now the rents are around 400 bucks uh, per unit. 400 to 500 and I'm covering utilities. So that's ends up like utility averages about hundred bucks. 
So effectively, I'm only collecting around like maybe like 300 to 400 a month. But after I'm done with renovations, um, and the renovations I'm doing, uh, just to kind of blaze through it, is uh, shaker kitchen cabinets, laminate countertops, LVP flooring, uh, light gray walls. You want to remove the popcorn ceiling, uh, new bathtub kits. Um, and why I do all that is because it's renter proof and it's cost effective and it looks very nice. And that's going to cost me $8,000 per unit. So I kind of blazed through that. Um, I'll probably go back one day and do a talk about renovations. But basically, like imagine your cookie cutter apartment complex that like, you can see even where I'm, I'm living right now, just like very cookie cutter. Like that's how you renovate it. And what's nice about LVP flooring is that it's pretty renter proof. Like you can't scratch it. It's water resistant. I mean, unless you drop a boiling pot of water on the LVP floor and leave it there for 10 minutes, that might damage it. But you just can rip it out and replace it easily. So you always have spare. So basically, after I'm done with renovations, eight thousand per unit, I can raise it to about seventy dollars per unit in rent. So if you go back to my value equation, value equals NOI divided by the cap rate. If I can raise the rents by three hundred dollars per unit times twenty six units times twelve, that's how much I increase my NOI, and you divide that by eight cap. So by doing that math, the apartment complex will be worth one point five million dollars, and then I'm gonna do a cash out refi of seventy five percent loan to value. And I anticipate I'm going to pull out $600,000 tax-free. So I'm going to pull out all my down payment, all my renovation costs, and another $400,000 tax-free. And then snowball that into another apartment complex. So, you know, once I learned that concept, it just blew my mind. I mean, I own a lot of single-family homes in California that I've appreciated by like half a million dollars. But, you know, it's just natural appreciation. Versus I've, I'm going to force over a million dollars in appreciation for my apartment complex and you get more cash flow. So after I learned that, I just said, you know, there's no point in me doing single family home unless like I'm living in that home. Like it just, it's just, it's just a waste of my time at this point to even think about single family homes. So once I kind of learned this concept, you know, like even to this day, I sent letters out a year ago and I'm still, I still get calls here and there from like these owners that like reached out to me. Like I just had an owner reach out to me for a industrial warehouse that I sent a letter out to like a year ago. Like I just saw, I saw him a year ago and, um, you know, he's a little more desperate now. So he's lowering his price by $300,000, but I'm going to try to like maybe sell or finance that deal. But this is kind of the compounding effect of, of letters and, and what you do. But then what I will emphasize is that like sending letters is half the battle. You have to literally, um, it's the soft skills. You have to build trust and rapport with the owner. That's how you kind of close on the deals. So I kind of blazed through that. Let me look through all the questions here. Um, so for letters, um, if, I, if you do it yourself, it's about 65 cents a letter. If you outsource it, it's 150. Uh, if you want to uh, send me, um, you can email me. I can give you a link, um, a referral link. And I think I'll, I'll give you like a five cent discount. If you reach out to me, if you want to use PropStream, also reach out to me. Uh, I'll give you a link as well for like a, a seven day free trial um, for that. Um, so sorry, I'm going to kind of blaze through these questions as well and then open it up to a general Q&A. Um, so for apartment complex at all, um, I invest in Oklahoma. And why I invest in Oklahoma is because number one, it's landlord friendly. Number two, has low property tax. And number three, I think uh, Texas is a little bit saturated at this moment. And I just wanted to focus more on cash flow. And Oklahoma is a very, I, I call it a steady eddy market. I mean, it appreciates significantly. Like I bought my apartment complex for about 20K per unit, but they're selling for like 50 to 60K per unit uh, at this moment, assuming it's more renovated. And then for, um, I'm going to defer the mobile home park question to another podcast. Um so CoStar, um, I mean, CoStar is nice in terms of data, but it's really expensive. I mean, let's say you have connections with a broker, um, you can get data to CoStar. Um, so for me, my, my hack is like, once you get an appraisal report, it's almost like a CoStar report. So now that I have an appraisal for my Oklahoma City apartment complex, like I know what the market cap rate is. I know what the price per unit is. I know what the market rents are, like from a lender's perspective. So that's what's always kind of nice. Um, for the down payment, um, so honestly, um, my single family homes built up a lot of equity. So I did cash out refis on those um, when the interest rates lowered during COVID. So I was able to pull out like over half a million dollars. 
but then you can also do um, investment HELOCs, HELOCs on investment properties. I know that it's been dying since COVID, but Bank of the West does investment HELOCs. If you need my contact, just send me an email and I'll connect you with my lender who does my investment HELOCs. And then if you guys invest in like stocks or index funds through Charles Schwab, you can do something called a pledged asset line of credit um, to get your started. So you can leverage up to 770% of your stock portfolio. So I have a decent sized stock portfolio as well. So I was able to leverage 7%, 70% of that. And the interest rate is like three to 4%, which is so cheap. And then also uh, First Republic Bank, they have a personal line of credit that gives you $100,000 at three to 4% interest only. And like, once again, if you want any of my contacts, just email me and I'll be happy to refer you. Um, but I basically um, came up with the money through myself. So for me, kind of my pet peeve of syndicators is that they will not put in, they won't have any skin in the game. They just raise money, right? Like they don't have any skin in the game. And like, if you don't have the feeling of like spending, like for me, I literally write like $50,000 checks a month of my own money towards renovation. And even though you plan that, just the emotional toll it takes on you to write $50,000. I mean, that's more than, that's like 5X what most people make um, in a month, like maybe 10X even. So just, you know, the emotional toll that if someone hasn't been through that, they have no business like raising money from people. So for me, I put my money where my mouth is. I want to build my systems in place. And then once I have my systems in place, I can easily scale. So like in Oklahoma City, like I have the system to scale from 26 to like a thousand units easily with my system right now. But I want to prove out my system first before I scale exponentially. And I want to prove to people that, you know, I've done it and I have the systems in place and I know my numbers and I can show you proof with my property that I have myself. So I think like later down the road, it, people will be throwing money at me without much effort from my um, point. Um, so for uh, yellow letters, so what I will say is think like a business. You know, eventually it took me eight hours to prepare 300 letters on the weekend to save like 65 cents a letter. You know, I make more money as a pharmacist. I'd rather just work an extra job, pick up an extra shift. And that makes me more money and outsource it to someone else. Um, once again, if you want uh, my contact from Yellow Letters, just send me an email. Um, let's see what else. Um, so looking at T12, so what's unfortunate about multifamily is in single family, like people can't fabricate things to you, like you have protections in place, but in multifamily, like they can fabricate the P&L, they can fabricate the profit and loss statement. And even if they show you their income statement or their bank statement, you can fake adding income into your bank account as rents. So even if they give you any stop or notice, I mean, it can still be fabricated. I mean, it might just have more... Maybe you can come back and try to sue if you wanted, but like in multifamily, it's assumed that if you're investing in apartment complexes, you're a sophisticated investor and you should know exactly what to do to validate it. For me, fortunately, you know, like I, when I took over a property, I was fortunate that, you know, the owner was being truthful, but what always happens when you take over a property is like five to six tenants will stop paying you because they know that as a new owner, you're going to come in, you're going to raise the rents. And they're going to want to milk it for like two, one to three months, one to two months. You know, Oklahoma, you can evict someone in 15 days. So it's very easy. If it's California, it takes like six to 12 months at least. And, you know, from there, like they know they're going to leave. So like what you do is they just, they're just not going to pay for one or two months. And then like you're giving them a notice and they'll just like flee. Like they'll just leave over the weekend or something. And then now you have a vacant unit. So that's why like you have to anticipate that. Like when I take over any apartment complex, I know that like a couple, 10 to 20% will not pay me. And then um, when you take over the apartment complex, everyone's gonna barrage you with like repair requests. Cause maybe the last owner didn't make any repairs. Maybe, um, you know, the owner didn't do anything, the prior owner didn't do anything. So I that happened to me. Like I did a full property inspection and I got hit with bed bugs. You know, bed bugs is so freaking expensive. It, it's $500 to fumigate each unit and you have to fumigate all 20 units. So it literally cost me $10,000 to fumigate all 20 units. And I think in rents, I'm collecting like maybe 6,000 like initially. So I'm just like, you always have these unexpected expenses, but if you buy the property correctly, it doesn't matter, right? Like $10,000 is nothing when I'm going to force 
and I'm gonna double the value of this apartment complex um, down the road. So you have to kind of think big picture, right? You can't like fret over like a couple of pennies here and there, you know, whatever, lose 10,000 here, but I make, you know, $400,000 over here. So you have to kind of look at the bigger picture um, in, in terms of things. Okay, I guess. Um, so for most, so basically, um, in my opinion, you don't have to start off in single family. It's just the easiest place to start because people feel very intimidated doing multifamily. Um, what I recommend for multifamily initially is just partner with someone on your first deal of experience. Um, and then once you kind of have that experience at that point, you know, you just can do a deal on your own. Right. But what's nice about partnering with someone with experience is that like, they can kind of like walk you through the process, like what, what's to expect, like what's there to be expected. Um, so yeah, in terms of selling my assets, I'm buying hold. So my, my goal is to not sell any uh, multifamily assets, but I am tempted to sell some of my single family homes. Like I had a RV park under contract in Oklahoma for $2.3 million. I need $600,000 down. I was very tempted in selling one of my single family homes, which had about $800,000 in equity to then trade up to the RV park, which would have made, you know, day one, $33,000 a month. Versus my single family home was getting around like $5,000 or $4,000 a month. So I, I am tempted in selling my single family homes, but kind of my philosophy is like, I don't like selling. Like you become wealthy by holding real estate, not by fixing or flipping or wholesaling. Like you make wealth by owning it long term. Like a lot of syndicators, they're incentivized to sell because they make money when they acquire, they make money when they manage it. Under, so they usually charge a one to three percent acquisition fee, a one to three percent asset management fee on the gross rents, and a one to three percent disposition fee if they do a cash out refi or they sell it. So if you look at that structure, syndicators are basically incentivized to sell and buy. But for me, I'm buy and hold. It's like I don't want to sell. And when you syndicate, you're at the mercy of the investors. If the investors want their return, then I'm forced to sell. So that's why right now I don't it doesn't make sense for me to you know, syndicate, but the nature of the beast is eventually I'm running on my own money. Right. And at that point I need to raise money, but I want to make sure that I'm like fully exhausted before I hit that point. And also you got to think about what your goal is too, right? Like, <clears throat> you know, my goal is to have freedom to do what I want. And if I just trade my pharmacist job for a syndication job, I'm just exchanging a job for a job. I mean, syndication, it's more flexible. It's, you know, not location dependent. You don't have to be at the hospital, but you're just essentially trading a job for a job. Like for me, I just want time freedom and I want options, right? That's, that's what I really want. So, <clears throat> you know, once I hit my 20K a month in net cash flow, like that's my fat fire goal, I'm done. And to be honest, my mobile home park just by itself, if it's full in like five to six years, it's probably going to make me like double that and just net cash flow, like when I'm done. So, you know, it just really depends on, on, on what your goal is. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I guess... Um, I guess for now, I'm going to open up to some questions. A anybody have any questions that's not in the comments? Hey, Steven. Yeah. Um, so, so great question. So I, I predominantly invest in mobile homes in the Southeast and it, it, their majority, t uh, um, t uh, prop, uh, park owned homes. Um, so I have park owned homes and I have tenant owned homes there. So as a, at a high level, it's 30, it's 200 lots. I got it for $1.1 $1 .1 million. I downed a hundred thousand dollars. I got a million dollar seller finance that 5% interest only for five years. And it's a really distressed park. I'll be honest. I, I've owned it for almost a year now. I was able to defer the interest payments for the first year, but once I'm so basically, it's thirty-five out of two hundred. So it's highly distressed, right? No lender would lend on this. So it either has to be seller financing or you're getting a hard money loan. 
but I was able to negotiate seller financing for a lower down payment than 5% is really cheap now, right? Like interest rates are probably 78% now for mobile home parks. So what my strategy I'm doing right now is for the first, like I'm, I have a lot of like vacant park owned homes there. So what I've been doing is I've been fixing them up and then renting them out. And then eventually I'm going to transition them over to rent to own and then make them, you know, tenant owned homes so that they'll just pay me lot rent. That's my ultimate goal. But the problem with my market in Alabama, so it's near, um, it's Montgomery, Alabama. A lot of these people are, have a renter mindset, so they're not used to like, you know, owning a home and the cost that comes with it. So you have to slowly transition them over. And what I'm starting to do now is like, for the longest time, it was hard to bring in a new home. So what's crazy about mobile home parks is I can get a line of credit, 100% finance a home to either rent out. So let's say a, a new mobile home costs around like $50,000 between the, it's a brand new three, three bedroom, two bath, single wide. Um, um, I think it was a, a true home from Clayton. And I got a line of credit, $1.5 million line of credit to basically bring that in, get a finance and I can rent it out for about $900 a month. Or if I sell it, I'll probably make around like, you know, three to $4,000 um, off the purchase price. And then also collect $300 in lot rent. So that's what I'm actually starting right now. I just got approved for my line of credit for $1.5 million starting in uh, September. I'm going to bring in three homes a month to initially rent out just to like have new homes in the community. But then once people start to see the new homes, I'm get, creating a wait list for people who are pre-qualified through 21st Mortgage to then um, buy my home. So my goal was I want to bring in three homes a month and sell three homes a month and collect $300 a month in lot rent. So for me, I don't build back the uh, water um, just yet. I just increased a lot of rent accordingly because um, in Alabama, it's it's a lot more difficult. You basically have to, there's a lot of permits involved with the Alabama or Montgomery uh, water utility service. So we just don't want to do there yet. We have other fish to fry. But what's crazy about this mobile home park is I bought it for a million dollars. I mean, this is my passion project. It, um, once it's full at 200 lots, it's going to be worth around $10 million. And I think I can do that in five years. So if you cash out refi this, uh, mobile home parks is 60% LTV. So I'll pull out $6 million tax-free and then pay back a million dollars and I'll have $5 million pocketed uh, tax-free after I'm done with the mobile home park. So if I do this in five years, that's about a million dollars a year on average uh, tax-free, which is the equivalent of a $2 million income, right? So I'm basically kind of like a a, a low uh, a bench warmer on an NBA team, um, assuming this mobile home park goes well. And then once I am successful in this park, then I'm going to take that $5 million or maybe two or three of it and buy another mobile home park. So it's definitely a longer term play. Um, you know, I kind of did the calculations, like my worst case scenario is I'm gonna lose $300,000, but best case is I'm gonna make a couple million. So that's why I like mobile home parks, but like it's, it definitely keeps me up the most at night. Like my apartment is pretty passive, um, but you know, you start off somewhere, right? So, you know, like that's why a lot of people like mobile home parks. And what's crazy is like, where else can you get a hundred percent leverage, right? <laughs> to bring in this home, you sell it. And then what I, what I incentivize my property manager is for every home that he sells, I give him 3% commission. So if he sells like a $50,000 home, he gets like around like 1200 bucks a month per home times three, that's 3,600 a month. I mean, he basically doubled his income. So, you know, that's what's crazy about mobile home park. So, you know, th this one, I kind of want to focus more on apartment complexes because that's where you know, apartment complexes probably intimidate like 80% of people here already. The next level is mobile home parks if you want to go there. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question there. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like LoopNet, Crexy, they're all the same to me. Like all the deals are overpriced. I've analyzed hundreds of deals on LoopNet and Crexy, and I've never once like found a deal that's good there. And even brokers that bring me off-market deals, I've never gotten a good deal from a broker, from LoopNet, and from Crexy. So it's, it's um, yeah. Actually, I'm not talking about...
Um, so Okay, yeah, I haven't had experience with that. I've, I've only used PropStream, which is like 100 bucks a month. So that's about 15 months, you know, all things being equal. But I think it really depends on your market. You know, I think for me, PropStream worked well in Oklahoma. And for mm -hmm. um, self-storage and mobile home parks, I use Data Axle. So PropStream isn't good for mobile home parks at all. So I use PropStream specifically for multifamily. Um, for the other sources, I, I use Data Axle, which you get to pay per lead. Um, so so yeah that that's kind of been my experience there and then kind of another um <clears throat> point i like to kind of emphasize is you know a lot of times <laughs> my pet peeve also is a lot of syndicators they make information so complicated on purpose and i can't tell if they make it so complicated that they're either just trying to sell you something or they just don't know what they're talking about and they're trying to seem smarter than what they really are but literally like apartment complexes is like very simple. At the end of the day, it's like a apartment complex. It's just like a bunch of little boxes that people live in and you just want to renovate and make sure you collect the rent, right? I mean, at the end of the day, and it's just a bunch of little houses that people live in. Um, so yeah, and if, for data Axel, like I said, if you want my contact, just, just send me an email. I, I'd be happy to share my data Axel contact um, with you guys um, there as well. But yeah, just just be very cognizant of syndicators that you know don't have any skin in the game, and skin in the game it does not include that three percent acquisition fee. Like they should, in my opinion, put at least ten percent of the money in. So if they're raising a million dollars. I expect them to have at least a hundred thousand dollars in that deal, like minimum. Like for me, if I ever raised money, I, I feel like I'd probably put in like you know fifty percent, just so I have more control of the property, um, versus like having someone else have control of the property and. When I do a cash out refi, if I own majority equity, I can just buy out my equity partner and just pay them out and then own the asset 100% myself. So that's kind of uh, my, my strategy over there. Um, yes. And any other questions? Yeah, Stephen. <clears throat> yeah, great question. So b basically, I had the down twenty five percent. So that was about a hundred and I think sixty k. I got sixty k back in credit, so that's a hundred thousand dollars for the down payment, and I had two hundred thousand dollars for the uh, renovations. So my renovations was we had labor shortages for a while in Oklahoma, so it was delayed by six months. So I, I had three hundred thousand dollars basically just to start. And like I said, you can get lines of credits. You can get it through First Republic Bank, $100,000 line of credit if you have a good W-2. And for me, like my mindset is like, if you don't have money and if your reason for syndicating is you have no money, you shouldn't be syndicating because if you can't handle your own money, you shouldn't be managing other people's money. That That's my mindset. And, you know, like if you like for, for data or for marketing, I spend 600 bucks a month, like between sending out letters, 300 letters and prop stream at the minimum $600 a month. Like if you can't afford that, like you should have no business being in, in, um, you know, multifamily, what you should be focusing on is either increasing your W2 income. So I spent my first four years climbing out from pharmacist to pharmacy director, or you can create a side business where you make money. So that, that would be my focus. If I was starting off is just increasing my income and then obviously learning about real estate, you know, and finding ways to maximize yourself first. Um, so that's kind of my philosophy, but I know everyone, you know, I've seen people like to your point, you know, they have no money and they, they built it up all that way. But, you know, to me personally, like if I lost, you know, I'm, I'm a healthcare professional by nature, I'm, I'm skeptical. Right. Um, and I always question things. So for me, I would feel bad if I lost like my parents hundred thousand dollars versus if I lost hundred thousand dollars, like it sucks, but I just work another year and I'll make that money. Right. So that's just kind of my mindset um, in terms of that process. I mean, there's, there's many other ways to like make money, in, you know, whether you're like, you know, wholesaling or something, but that's just kind of my philosophy because I just seen a lot of people get burned by syndicators who 
you know, they, they talk all fancy, but they don't know what they're doing at all. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so wait, no syndicate specifically hurt me. It's just like you said, by nature, I'm so skeptical. And like when, if you can't explain your deal at a sixth grade level, you don't understand the deal at all. Like if you're overcomplicating these things to seem more intelligent, so people trust you, you haven't mastered the subject yet. So that's just kind of like, you know, I'm a pharmacist, right? Like if I can't explain my medication to you, like it's, it's useless, right? <laughs> I understand all the mechanism of action, all that, but like, if I can't explain in a simple way, it's useless. So like if a syndicator can't explain it in a simple way, they don't understand it. So because I studied so much real estate, like I can tell if someone's knowledgeable enough or not quickly at this point, because I've done it, you know, thousands of times, but for someone like brand new, you know, like, oh, this sounds amazing, but they don't know like what to expect. That's why I, I literally, you know, like, like real estate brokers, like they're licensed and they're certified yet they fabricate their you know, offering memorandums all the time, like all of them fabricated. And I literally will send them my analysis after like talking to a lender and they don't even say anything back to me. They just move on to the next person. So like, that's why I go off market. And that's why, you know, I, and also syndicators, you got to trust, but verify, right? Like you want to see their track record. Like when, when I syndicate down the road, whatever, five, 10 years, if I sit, decide to syndicate, like I'll tell you exactly like how much my expense is. Like my, my apartment complex, my 26, I'm spending 56% like right now. But I haven't raised my rents yet because I'm renovating it right now. Um, in terms of uh, resources um, that I found the most useful, um, to be honest, there's no like book out there or even YouTube or even like bigger pockets um, that kind of does step by step. I'm actually working on some a course to make a step by step course on how to basically close a deal. Uh, I'm beta testing it right now, but I'm working on a version 2.0 where basically my goal of my, my course is if you follow A through Z, you should be able to close in your first apartment complex in six to 12 months. So basically that's what I did, right? I closed on my first apartment in six months, after six months of implementing the system. So I plan on kind of creating something like that um, to kind of create, because I, I spent $30,000 to learn that system. Um, but I, um, want to make it a more affordable option for people, but like I say out the gate, like, you know, the, the education, it's not going to be cheap. Like I said, if you can't afford even a, a basic course, you have no business doing apartment complexes or even real estate at that point. In my mind, you should be focusing on building your, your inc other income streams, whether that's a business or W2. Um, so in terms of a beta tester, I finished a 1.0 already um got a lot of great feedback but i feel like i know what i need to do for 2.0 and honestly what i'm creating is i'm gonna make my course better than what my mentor gave me um because i feel like there's a lot of things that he, he didn't really provide me that i kind of learned on my own so i'm gonna do like a lot of like live demos and going over like inspection reports appraisal reports uh, lois um how to soft skills and how to interview the owners like just it's gonna be like i, I think i I, I uh, outlined it. It was almost like 50 to 60 videos <laughs> going step by step. So, you know, that, that's in the pipeline. Um, I, I've been working on that, but that's down the road. Um, in, in terms of value, um, that's a good question. I never thought of that. I always just like to give value to people because it, it's kind of weird. Like I wish I had someone to teach me all this stuff like growing up. So I kind of just it's almost like therapy for me <laughs> just to teach people that want to listen. Um, but in terms of providing value, um, I just would say just share, you know, all my videos on YouTube. Like I said, I'm just trying to put free information out there for people and, and share my resources. Um, and then, you know, obviously if, if you want to use me as your mentor and JV on a couple of deals, a lot of people reached out to me for that. You know, certainly I'm open to that uh, as well, uh, just because I'm just kind of my, my kind of deals right now. I'm just kind of waiting for them to finish. Um, so I have a bit more free time. That's why I'm doing these weekly calls now. Like I was just too busy, to be honest, at first to even like do these calls. Um, but, you know, that and then, you know, later down the road, you know, to test beta test version 2.0 of my course, you know, certainly down the road. And you know, if you guys want one on one coaching, you know, certainly I'm open to that. Um, but usually I try to just do it in a group setting to give, 
you know, multiple people value instead of just one person. Um, so we got five minutes left. I'll take one question. One more question. Better be good. Yeah, so um, I so as part of the inspection, they do scope the sewer. They do assess the electrical. That's how I knew the panels were recalled. So it was pretty comprehensive. And then also, like, you know, the lender will ask for my inspection report, too. And a, a phase, so basically a phase one is, like, environmental study. And then phase two is a deeper dive. I didn't have to do that. But it depends on your lender, right? So for my mobile home park, I had to do a phase. Well, it was seller finance. So I didn't have to. But for mobile home parks, you do have to do a phase one study. And if it doesn't turn out good, then you have to do a phase two. So I typically encourage you to get a phase one. If, if let's just say, like, your apartment complex is next to a gas station, there might be, like, a huge gas leak underground. And it might contaminate the soil of your apartment complex. And let's say you had a pool at your apartment. You know, it's a hazardous risk, right? So in that situation, I probably would. But mine was not near anything. So I didn't do a phase one and my lender didn't require it. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Cool. So, um, just wanted, we have three minutes left. Um, it's going to cut off a uh, hard in three minutes. Just wanted to thank everybody, um, for hopping on today. Uh, once again, I, I know I went fast. I just wanted to do a Q and a, but this will be recorded, uploaded to YouTube. Um, if you want any of my contacts for PropStream, Yellow Letter Complete, Data Axel, Lenders, whatever, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to connect you with my um, my contacts. You know, if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, even talking about deal, whatever, just reach out to me via email. Um, I will put my email out to the group um, if you don't have it, but it's just the same email that I always have. But I'll send out my email for everybody. And like, once again, like I said, this will be uploaded on YouTube. And if you have a suggestion you want me to talk about for next week, um, you can also shoot me an email or just comment on one of my YouTube videos. Um, I, I'm pretty responsive to those. Uh, just put a comment and I'll do a topic. Um, and like I said, down the road, my, my course is going to be pretty like step by step on what I'm doing. This one, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit just because it's, you know, an hour session. Um, other than that, thank you for everyone's... Um, support hope you see you next week encourage you to just share the link for anybody and i hope you guys found value from this thank you so much everyone have a good night thank you